Hi, I'm Beth Green, and with me today is Gary Moss, Lynn Hicks, Jane Joyce. And our topic of discussion is the impact of social media on our mental health. Well, when we talk about social media and mental health, we always think of it in a negative context, but there are benefits. And we're going to talk about the benefits today as well. But I'm, when it, as we look at each other here, I think all of us would say that uh, we remember the evolution of technology. I can remember back, as far back as the 1960s, but even before that, um, the first computer took up 1,800 square feet and weighed 55 tons. Does anybody ever remember a computer being that big? <laughs> I remember one bigger than that because my first computer was at Vanderbilt and it was in a room the size of a gymnasium. And uh, it, uh, it was, had so many tubes and it ran so hot they could only run at night. And they had to open all the windows to run the computer. So you got your stack of cards ready during the day and then you left it at the computer center and it ran that night. You went back the next morning and got your error messages. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've come a long way okay. from that to what we hold in our hands today. But uh, by the 1960s, I think they filled a small room. By the 1970s, a desk. By the 1980s, we were able to have personal computers, but they were so expensive mm -hmm. that people couldn't afford them. But by the 1990s, people were, uh, had personal computers in their homes, and then we went to laptops, and now to what we can hold in our hands. And the world of technology has, a, has just evolved into what we have now. And um, so today, we're basically focused on social media and how it impacts our mental health. We do have a lot of benefits of social media. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what the benefits are of social media. And of course, for social media, we're talking about Facebook, we're talking about YouTube, um, Snapchat, Instagram, Pinterest, all of the above. And, um, and so what are some of the benefits of social media on our mental health? I know for me, it has been a way to reconnect with people. I left Maryville in 76, 72, to go to college and lost track of my high school friends. You know, everybody scatters. But about five years ago, about 10 of the girls I went to high school, we've been able to reconnect on Facebook. We try to get together once a month to uh, celebrate birthdays in that month, to reconnect. To, and we, we pray for each other. We send messages, you know, checking on each other. We have been able to reconnect, and it's been really nice. It's like revisiting high school without out all the angst that goes with it, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and what does that do for you personally when, when you have the ability to reconnect with old friends? It, it gives me a sense of my own life history mm -hmm. of going back. They remind me of things that I have forgotten. Mm -hmm. And then I, I'm like, yeah, I do remember that. I remember we went to that or we did that. So it's given me a, a sense of the history that was kind of a blank. I couldn't remember how much I had shared with other people. You know how you do. When you get away from that, you, you lose that connection. But now I get a sense of that. And then I've connected also with several of the people I went to college with in the 70s. And that's been nice, too. Uh, and actually, the other day, I put something on there about Waylon Jennings, and a friend reminded me that we went to see him in concert in the 80s. I forgot that. You know? So, I mean, it's been, you know, it is like a little timeline for my yeah. life. Yeah. Well, it is kind of releasing some of those happy chemicals mm -hmm. and just giving a special meaning to life. Yeah. What are some of the other benefits? Well, I use it a lot of times for um, information gathering. Uh, as a lifelong learner, it's amazing what we have at our fingertips. Yes, we have to watch the sources and make sure that we're getting accurate information, but um, being able to just look up at any moment um, topics or uh, um, even, even 
in locations around us? You know, what is the store around us? Or what is the closest store that carries this? Um, or even researching products of where you can um, find these. But it, it's a lifelong learner. I think that you, you, the amount of information we have at our fingertips that we don't have to go search through periodicals <laughs> in, in the library or stacks and stacks of volumes, it, it's right there. Yeah. So for me, that's, that's where I use it probably the most. For me, the, the benefit, <laughs> mental health benefit for me is kind of indirect. It gives my wife something to do while I'm reading. <laughs> That's good. It keeps her occupied. <laughs> right. So your wife is busy on social she media. She likes it yeah. and spends a lot of time on it. But. Yeah. I think um, being in, in social media, I, I have a Facebook account. And I enjoy it from time to time. Uh, but it gives me a sense of belonging. You know, it connects me with people that I normally don't see. It connects me with people that um, encourage me and give me gives me a sense of belonging. Um, it makes me feel good. Not only that, it gives me the opportunity to uh, encourage others. And so how do you think that can be beneficial for our own mental health? Well, now that people <coughs> live um, more scattered across the country, um, that we're not, um, families are, are scattered and, and friend groups are scattered, I think that that sense of belonging, it kind of, um, narrows the distance and the feel. Um, when people used to live on plots of land all together or families lived all together on the farm, we don't have that in, in many ways. And so that sense of belonging comes back in and that you're connected through social media. I think too, um, that, 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 that sense of belonging, um, again, the positive, feelings, the positive that, that I belong, I'm connected, I'm, I'm loved. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. loved. Uh, so I have a friend, Kenny Wood, and I met him on social media through Randall O'Brien, who was president of Carson Newman, uh, just retired. And Kenny is a former pastor who lives in Texas. So he has a postings nearly every day, and it's our church of the air is what he calls mm -hmm. it. And so there's a little message from him. He usually has a bit of theology with it. So it's given me it food for thought. I'm mm -hmm. getting food for thought from him, from the other people that follow him too. Mm -hmm. So I see it. It's not only a positive thing, but it also makes me think. I'm not just taking in. I'm also, okay, let's turn this around in your mind. What is he saying here, and how does that relate to me? So it's been, for me, that has been a good byproduct, if you will, just stimulating me to think a little bit outside the box. Mm -hmm. Podcasts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what you're saying. Absolutely. We love podcasts. Well, he's, no, he posts on Facebook. Okay. Okay. All right. And so, um, and podcasts, you're right, though, podcasts, Dr. Carolyn Leaf mm -hmm. is a really good mental health specialist, and she has, I just recently uh, forwarded one of her podcasts on dealing with anxiety and panic attacks mm -hmm. on Facebook, mm -hmm. but she, she has a really good... And as a counselor, it's been a good resource to give some of my clients, right. you know, go to this podcast. I think mm -hmm. you, and they're not real long. Mm -hmm. So it's been a real good resource in that way. Yes. You know, as a Christian, um, one of the things that we have the benefit of social media um, is prayer request. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can post a prayer request on social media and know that we have a Christian community praying for us. Mm -hmm. and um, Quickly and a lot of people. Quickly mm -hmm. and reaching a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Have you ever uh, noticed someone's Facebook post that has a prayer request? What do you see along with that? You see encouragement. Mm -hmm. You see someone actually posting their prayer for them. Mm -hmm. um, even those who have lost loved ones, um, uh, a whole host of encouragement can come through uh, the avenue of, of social media. Mm -hmm. So uh, it gives us that, that sense of encouragement. Any, can anyone think of any other things that, that really benefit our mental health? Well, for businesses, I think that one thing is uh, the marketing, the free marketing. A lot of small business owners, they may not have a lot of um, money to pour into 
uh, billboards or um, some of the more um, costly forms of advertising, but social media can put that out there and 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 again spread marketing their business, marketing their services um, to a lot of people quickly. Um, I know a lot of business owners use different um, group chats or um, LinkedIn and as ways to connect with other professionals. Um, and so that can be a huge stress relief Absolutely. Um, yeah. for a new business owners who are trying to um, spend their money wisely. Mm -hmm. And so the stress involved with that, that would be one way that's a positive uh, benefit of social yeah. media. Yeah, it's stress relief. And the stress for, relief, for yes. small business well, owners. You know, our media department does a great job of using Facebook to promote things that are coming to the church. And every time that they put something up, let's say a concert's coming or we're going to have a special event, every time they put that up, then you can look down there and see how many people have shared it, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. multiplies Surprise the it. amount of people mm -hmm. because all of us are not just limited to church members on our Facebook where we have a wide variety of people. And so every time something's posted like what what is coming or one of Brother Dean's sermons or one of Brother Green's advertisements about the choir. <laughs> but we, we get those up on there and then we reach so many yeah, multiple multiplies. different types of people. Right. Yeah. Do you know? Groups, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, a while ago you were saying that uh, even for small business owners it's a stress reliever. And um, but then on the on the flip side, when we talk about social media, there are some negative impacts that we have. And when we talk about mental health, we have to be careful how we apply social media to our lives, how we use social media, because on one hand, it can be a stress reliever. On the other hand, it can create stress. So let's move into ways that possibly social media may have a negative impact on our mental health. Well, we've been talking about um, the positive feelings that we have and the endorphins that it gives. And I think that for many teens, that's true in the likes. Mm -hmm. um, they count their likes. The more followers they have, it creates this euphoria and this um, sense of belonging. But it also um, can be uh, what happens with the reverse mm -hmm. when they don't get the response that they're hoping for or they don't get the likes um, or the, the uh, responses there. Yeah. They, a lot of times, we can see emotionally, they will tank. Mm -hmm. And we can see that they feel excluded or they're not a part of whatever's going on that's been posted. They feel left out. Um, so I think there are some real um, red flags there yeah. in, in how um, someone who may be fragile or someone who may be already feeling left out, mm -hmm. it kind of perpetuates that emotion when they see what's going on out here and they've not been a part. And we also know the effects that social media has had on bullying mm -hmm. and suicide. Yes. And we have to be very mindful. The number one cause of death for um, as of February 2019, the number one cause of death ages 10 to 18 in the state of Tennessee is suicide. And we have to be mindful of how much is that fueled by social, social media, media, by bullying, by bullying on social media, or by just, like you say, they're not getting their likes, they're not getting their perks. So we have to be very mindful. That's a very crucial age, and it's all emotion. And that's what they're feeling off of there. And the negativity weighs them down. So we, we've got to, to take some responsibility with children of that age to make sure that we are bolstering them up aside from social aside media. From social media. Yeah. Especially for teenage girls, I think there's a lower level of just depression mm -hmm. related to, to social media. There's a lot of pressure on a teenage girl. It's looks, it's popularity, it's, you know, all these things that, you know, are pressure, pressurizing them. And they are easily affected, you know. And, and now there's more mean girls around, it seems like, than there are supportive friends for that age group. 
And so their self-esteem is on a mm-hmm. roller coaster, yeah. you know, daily or even hourly mm-hmm. um, because they're, they're tied to their phones. And so it's an emotional roller coaster. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, they'll, uh, a post uh, or, or selfie, there's, there's the, the me, the selfie me <laughs> and, um, you know, posting, posting that on social media and then waiting for those likes to come. And if the likes don't come, if the positive comments do not come, then there's a whole identity that that is wrapped up in those likes. Right, wrapped those up comments. in social media yeah. rather than their identity being in Christ that yeah. stabilizes them. And they don't have real clear-cut ways of acting. They're more impulse-controlled. Mm-hmm. And I know that sexting, which is where they're sending pictures of themselves to what they think is a trusted boyfriend, you know, that gets out of hand because they share it with all their friends. And before long, something that someone thought was done in private between two people is all over the school, and everybody laughs about it. So, I mean, you you talk about the phone always being in hand. There you go. It's an instant picture. Mm-hmm. Popping up. No one wants to be embarrassed. No, that it, that just a um, uh, person's self esteem again just tanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another thing I was thinking about was some hot topic issues that we often get involved in on Facebook, involving political discussions, involving um, current events. Uh, have you ever seen any of those? I've gotten drawn in on a few. <laughs> Confession time. (laughs) That's why I started grinning because, Mm -hmm. you know, especially during the election, um, it was so, everybody was so polarized. You know, here's my opinion, here's my opinion, and and everything. Nobody compromised. There wasn't dialogue. It was all argument and blame. And, it, it, you know, you could feel like you'd run a marathon by the time you stopped reading some of those posts. Mm -hmm. That went on, and it is very easy if you feel strongly about something. There's also a lot that is posted about Christians, you know, pro and con about Christians, and that's another hot topic. If you feel strongly about something, it's almost like your fingers are drawn to post something. And then, okay, relationships get strained. You know, you fight with people you've never even met, you know, and probably won't, you know, if you're fighting with them anyway. But but it, it is very easy to get emotional pull. That and those is negative trick. emotions yeah. are what pulls us. And we, we all know from Gottman's research that it only takes one negative comment mm-hmm. to cancel out the good we feel from five to seven yeah. positive comments. Right. But yet... Um, those negative comments are what draws that emotional response from us mm-hmm. and, and the negativity. Neuroscience yeah. tells us that we're wired for negativity anyway, mm-hmm. and that's from our caveman ancestors because they had to be on the outlook because T-Rex was going to eat them at any time. <laughs> but we are wired that way, mm-hmm. and a lot, you know, a lot of our work with depression and anxiety is trying to build those positive neuro pathways, but when we are wired for negativity already, then it feeds right into that center. It increases your anxiety, it increases depression, but it's that neural pathway and it really feeds us. And we know that that negativity comes from the fact that we are fallen creatures living in a fallen world, that God created us, but yet when man sinned, then... uh, it affected everything. And so I think because of our sinful nature within us, we are drawn. We are drawn to the negative. And also all of those discussions <clears throat> are made out of the context of relationship. It has There may be no basis of relationship in who you're responding. So you haven't earned the right to engage with that person in um, it, it could be misunderstood yeah. how you're, how you're, they don't know your tone. <laughs> they don't know your personality because it's all in black and white. And so a lot of the things and the cues that we use to read people are absent mm-hmm. in those posts. And so I think that makes it hard. I think yeah. it, 
um, I think it makes it hard to know really where is that person coming from. Well, you hit a good point though when you said relationship. We don't have the relationship, and that's another thing that social media. There's a negative bias there because we are not having true relationships. But people are starting to count the relationships on Facebook and and on the rest of it as more important than actually face-to-face conversation and getting to know somebody. So we're losing the ability to sit one-on-one with each other and to talk into, like the the old days, how we became friends in the old days. We're not doing it now. Sit on the front porch and drink iced tea. (laughs) People aren't doing that. We We post emojis with our coffee. Right, with our coffee. We post emojis with our (laughs) coffee. But the emojis really... you don't hear voice inflections. Sometimes it helps to have an emoji posted with a comment uh, that that might help um, define uh, it. define a t- or intent take it down. or take, take it, it down. take yes take the edge off of it. An emoji may do that, but that doesn't um, substitute for. Uh, voice inflections right. for sincerity right. we face may not to face and face interaction. to face interaction because we can read people better yeah. that yeah. way it really bothers me to go to a restaurant and see everybody on their phones sometimes even talking to each other on their phones yeah. Rather than yeah. to each other in front exactly. of exactly i've i know somebody told me that they were sitting next to their grandchildren on the couch watching a movie and the grandchildren were talking to each other on their phone about the movie <laughs> you know instead of they're right beside each other, you right. know? Yeah, right. yeah, and our, nothing replaces eye contact. That's right. Yeah. Our children are losing the ability to know how to interact face-to-face mm-hmm. because of the phone in their hands. Yeah. That's their first go-to, like mm-hmm. you just said, mm-hmm. rather than just turning and engaging one-on-one. You know, we've talked a lot about mental health on social media, but I think it has some uh, effects on our physical health. Mm-hmm. It can affect our sleep. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, sure can. Yeah, late night browsing mm-hmm. gets late. our minds stimulated rather than calming yeah. down. Well, we we build again. We build a neural pathway. We begin to respond to that being of an incoming message or or text. We respond to it just as we would have responded to a danger stimulus or an awareness stimulus. So we become more and more addicted. You know, we've got to pick it up. We've got to look right away. And I'm guilty of it because some days I'll be like, oh, you know, and it'll be like, you know, come shop at Sam's or something. (laughs) It won't be anything important. But I still get that little rush, Mm -hmm. you know, and then that builds up anxiety over time. Okay, you keep having that little rush and that little rush. And we don't do the physical activity anymore that releases what we build up. Mm -hmm. So we can work up into a good state of anxiety. And not to mention that we're short-circuiting our attention span. You know, it's hard to watch a movie all the way through now (laughs) because it's like, okay, I watched it for three minutes. You know, I need to do something else. But we are short-circuiting a lot of things. And uh, there was a study that I read the other day talking primarily about toddlers and young children and how they're not having the learning experiences now because they're amused with a phone game or they're amused with the iPad game. And so they're not having learning. So it is affecting their brain uh, development. Mm-hmm. You know, most of the time, infants, toddlers, young children learn by doing. But they're not doing anything. They're just staring at a screen. So it really affects that development. It's very stimulating for uh, young children to have that screen activity, but what it does is it creates their own, it, it's, it decreases their own creativity mm-hmm. to be doing something with their hands, or it, it uh, decreases their imagination, right. and, right. and children need to be using their it imaginations. It can build in ADHD, yeah. again, because they're having constant stimulation, yeah. you know, rather than, I'm, you know, going for a nap, playing with a toy, Mm -hmm. being outside, doing all those things that was normal for when I was that age. And I think you found some other things about children. Oh, that's a whole different topic, but that's that's kind of a pet peeve of mine is is what parents let kids do to fill up their time rather than encouraging them to do things that are active and outside and the kind of things you talk about. 
it, it's a whole different world, and I don't fit into it. Um, but I'm so glad when I see parents who don't let their kids fit into that world exclusively when they're young. Mm -hmm. I think it's so, so important that, that parents exclude that kind of time from the day. So, for example, I have a nephew that he, one of his, he's very into the media. He, he does movies and other things commercially. But when he comes home, he puts his phone on the mantle, and until the kids go to bed, he won't respond to it. Mm -hmm. He spends time with the kids, doing things with the kids. And to me, that's the kind of thing parents need to be doing. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's many parents around. use the um, phone or an iPad as a babysitter yep. yeah. to keep them yeah. quiet. Or the TV. Or the TV. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was young, that was, don't let the TV be your babysitter. Mm -hmm. and that was back oh, when yes. we didn't even have color TV then. <laughs> yeah. So, But, I mean, that was, and now it's become even more there's so much more variety now, yeah. you know, that on the iPad and on the phone and everything that they. So it's very tempting when yes. you can't handle it right. to stick this pad in front. They of will them. zone. Yeah. They, I mean, it works. It <laughs> they does. zone out. Well, I'm so out of it. I I think get a life. You know? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> because to me, a life is doing things, and you know, I like my computer, but my computer is a tool, and I don't want it to take over my life. Absolutely. You were talking about the physical um, risks and what we're talking about now with the children and saying, you know, they're more sedentary. They're not um, they're not active, like you said, uh, which weight gain is mm -hmm. a huge well, problem. We've seen a big rise in obesity yes. just in general population, and I think that uh, screen time has a lot to do with that because studies have shown it, you know, there's a lack of mobility when we're on our screens, and that it increases... Obesity well, what we're learning and about the, inactivity. What we're learning about the brain is it's very specific. If you're working on the computer, you're using a different part of the brain than you're using when you're out playing outside. Mm -hmm. And if kids don't kind of get that full uh, exposure to, to to life, their brains are being malformed, mm -hmm. and we don't even know what that means yet. That's true. Um, and that goes for us as well, especially as adults. And I think, you know, we need to be aware of the risk mm -hmm. of social media that it has on, you know, uh, even especially our inactivity. We're at a time, uh, you know, I, I've reached the age of 60. I'm at a time in my life where I need to be out. I need to be moving. I need to be active. And it's very easy just to sit down and have that screen time. And... Um, you know, there are some other areas of social media that we're going to discuss in a few moments and um, something that um, I think all adults need to be aware of, and that's the topic of algorithms. We've been discussing the impact of social media on our mental health. We've discussed some of the positives and some of the negatives, but there's a part of social media that many of us may not be aware of. We've invited Doug Johnson, our media pastor, to come and share a little bit uh, with us about algorithms and how they work. Well, it's good to be here, first of all. But this, this issue of, and I guess you could say, for lack of a better term, somebody watching you, is not just in social media, but it's in all of our internet activity, to be honest with you. And it really started with the concept of businesses wanting to be able to target market their advertising. So in other words, they want to put their ads in front of individuals that are interested in buying the product. And that's one thing that the computer systems allow us to do. That's one thing that the internet allows us to do. It allows us to target advertising for people that's interested in it. So imagine for a programmer who lives his life on if-then statements. <laughs> if this occurs, then do this. So it's just a logical expression. So for social media, you may be posting things such as, I like kittens. Okay. And so maybe I'm looking for a new kitten for my family. You know, if you like cats, that is. All right. So when you do this and you start searching for kittens... These social media um, companies like Facebook, Twitter, all these others, plus at Google as well, are collecting that data. And they're saying that this individual is looking for kittens. 
So are there advertisers out there that are advertising kittens? Okay. Or maybe pet products, maybe cat food, maybe cat houses, maybe cat toys. All of a sudden, they're going to start posting those things because of your interest on your places in Facebook and any social media realm about things that you're interested in. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about it. There's a constant collection of data. Recently, uh, the European Union had required all websites to be able to say, hey, we're collecting information about you. <clears throat> this is the cookie thing that you see, a pop-up for the first time that you visit a website. It says that we are collecting cookies. <laughs> and basically, we are collecting information. We're reading that disk when you come to our website to be able to see where your, your history is, where you're going, what you're searching for, what you're doing, information about you. And we'll take that and use that as part of the information or data that we send to advertisers and say, do you want to advertise in front of this person? Mm. So they're constantly collecting information. If you say no, then one of two things can happen. Either they don't collect the data or they don't let you you know, receive, receive all the information that you need from that site. But as these algorithms continue to grow, there's also with the good comes the bad. You know, what else can we learn about you? You know, what else can we find out about your religious beliefs? What can we find out about your political interest? What can we find out about where you work? What your activities, your hobbies are, your interests are? You know, all those pictures we post on Facebook, <laughs> all that's collected. When you post a post on Facebook, when you set up an account on Facebook, there is a terms of agreement that you must sign that say, I accept. If you don't accept those terms of agreement, you won't access Facebook. So what do those terms of agreements say? What are they collecting? Names, family members, job functions, interests, photos, personalities, um, all kinds of data about you. Because to them, that's money. You don't have to pay to be on Facebook. But they have to make their money somewhere, and it's on advertising. But do they also do anything additional with that information? Well, sometimes they'll sell it to third parties, you know, other companies that are interested in that information. Those algorithms almost become an intelligence of their own, categorizing you into areas that you live, you know? So if you, if I want to market on Facebook, if I want to say, hey, I want an ad and I want it to show up in front of everybody in Hamlin County who is female, age 30 to 50, who has an interest in religious beliefs, um, who has two kids, I can target that ad because they know everything about you. So basically, every time we input information into social media or on the internet, we are creating a profile. Yes. Okay. The more information you put, the greater the profile. The, and the more specific your profile becomes. Exactly. That's a lot of implications. That is. It? That yeah. is. And even, even more than that, um, <clears throat> they were doing it a, I think it was on 2020 or one of the nightly news um, that happens on the weekend was trying to determine, because if you have, let's say, a Google app on your phone, and, or maybe you're running an Android type of device that's actually Google underneath it. They track everywhere you go. I can actually turn on on my phone and say, at the end of the month, I want to report it everywhere I went. Wow. And it will, it will categorize mm -hmm. all the top restaurants. It'll categorize. <laughs> it'll tell me how much time I spent driving, mm -hmm. what places I stopped, how much time I spent at each place. Then the, the news basically said, can you turn this off? And so they had a computer expert say, okay, I'm going to turn that feature off and I'm also going to shut the phone down. And they drove all over New York and they turned the, the phone back on and they went to their profile. And by the time they had gone to their profile, all the information of where they went was there. <laughs> so it knows more information about us than we know about ourselves. Yeah, or that we care yeah, to know. That we, that we care to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even with it off. <clears throat> Even with it off. I mean, there's, you know, if that phone can collect data, it will collect data. Mm -hmm. And that's because we've given it the rights to do so. We've said, yes, we want to use this phone. I accept these rights. Mm -hmm. Yes, I want to use this social media platform. I accept whatever, whatever implications that may mean to me. 
And then down the road, we complain that, why, why are they doing this? Because yeah. we said yes. <laughs> okay, because they're not going to do it without some legal guidelines to right. be able to do that. Right. Um, so these, and you, you're starting to hear terms uh, today called artificial intelligence. And that's allowing the computer more and more control of being able to make decisions without human intervention. So as it collects data, it's the same thing as we collect information about what our kids do. And we make decisions based on their actions. These computer programs, these algorithms are making decisions based on the data it has collected. You know, and that could be very negative. Mm -hmm. You know, that could actually... It feels manipulative. It does. <laughs> it does. Other countries, uh, closed countries, are, mm -hmm. using, are using it to, as a negative purpose. I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's reports about how China creates a social media rating system yeah. based on information they've collected about you. Mm -hmm. You know, and based on that rating system allows you certain benefits. And so, where does that information come from? Well, everybody has a phone. Yeah. Everybody has that device to collect information, you know, and we enjoy it because we want that social experience. Yeah. We want that social currency, for lack of a better term, to say, my stuff is liked by other people. You know, recently, back in the month of May, Instagram did a test experiment in Canada. What they did is they decided to turn off the likes where other people could see them, the the creator of the information, the uploader of the post, could see how many likes he or she had. But other people could not, in Canada, see how many likes you had. Right. People lost their mind. <laughs> I mean, really. Because wow. they realized that this is actually value to the individual. The more I do, liked by more people, is a good thing. So, therefore, I am going to change my behavior so that other people will like me more based on the type of posts that I make, the type of pictures that I take, what I upload to the, to the internet. So is that, even in our own sense, looking at how people react to our content, saying, this is a good thing or a bad thing. Do I need to change my behavior? Do I need to do something different that other people like? And then you have the, um, then you have the algorithms on top of that manipulating you in a different direction, being able to say, you know, when you get up this morning, I think that you're going to need a good cup of coffee from McDonald's, you know, because that's what you've done for the past five days. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm wow. thinking that if you know enough about this, and I'm thinking about another negative, like um, pedophiles searching mm -hmm. on Facebook, they can actually create a profile that will make them find victims, correct? That's correct. So, that, I mean, that has far-reaching implications, but also for the victim, their profile has to be monitored because it's going to come up age, sex, interests, and that's how they can find them. Mm -hmm. And the police are doing the same thing. Yeah. You know, the police are actually... Uh, creating accounts as individuals to be able to find the pedophiles. Yeah, the TBI is, is doing that. They, you know, they have like six people in a room, and that's what they do, mm -hmm. is monitor their profile and try to search them out. So our playground, for lack of a better term, is no longer the front yard where all the kids used to play when I grew up. Mm -hmm. Okay? It's now the <clears throat> digital environment to where I want to create a, a profile about me that I think other people are going to like, which may not be who I am at all. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then you have other companies, other organizations manipulating us by the data that we put on those sites to get us to act a certain way. And you can really lose yourself. <laughs> you lose the way that you really are by trying to find, get more likes, mm -hmm. fall into it's all of this. You know, it's, yeah, not, it's, it's not, not real. A facade. And yeah. then for somebody that has mental health issues anyway, that can really rock them. You know, because they lose sight of their self. Right. They don't understand who they are. All they become is a very advanced people pleaser. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's what the likes do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we need to know that this is going on. We need to know because it, it can change the way that we use social media. I mean, there may be some that do not care. 
but that's what I was going to say. Some people don't want to know. Yeah, some people don't want to know. Well, one of the things that would be really good to do is a good experiment. And let's say whatever, maybe Facebook, whatever social media um, platform that a person uses, go to the terms of use. Mm -hmm. Go to their privacy clause or policy that they may have and read through it. The thing that you accepted, go back and read through it. Because nobody ever reads it. I read it word for word. Mm -hmm. And did it make you want to close your account? Um, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> okay. Well, you know, Facebook uh, launched Messenger some time ago, and there were Messengers a lot more intrusive than G- the actual Facebook mm-hmm. app is uh, because it actually yes, collects it information yes, about phone does. calls. Yeah. They can actually record information. Mm-hmm. All that's in their, their terms of use, unless they've changed it recently. And, you know, for a long time, I said, I am not turning on Messenger just because of, of what the, the clauses were in their terms of use. Um, but more and more people almost demand that, okay, this is the way I'm sending messages now. I'm sending it rather than an email. I want to send it by messenger. I want to actually try to make a video call to you on messenger. I'm going to, I'm going to try to contact you. And so at some point in time, I, I actually myself gave in and said, okay, and I want to turn this on because this is how people are trying to contact me because they don't want to use email anymore. They don't want to text anymore. They want to use messenger because that is completely about everything that they do. Mm-hmm. That was the very terms of agreement that I read the other day. With the messenger? With the messenger, yeah. The messenger seems to be the most aggressive. Yeah, because I have a new iPhone, mm-hmm. and so I had to put that back on there. And um, it, uh, a lot of people do use messenger. And, um, and The good thing yeah. is, is that with the awareness, you stopped and took time yeah. to read it. Right. So that you went in with eyes open. Sometimes we just agree to yes. it so we can have oh, the benefit. Exactly. Of and you don't it. have time. Yeah. You want yeah. it quickly. Yeah. So but, but we're losing more and more control mm-hmm. over who we are. That's just basically what I'm hearing is that we are losing control over who we are and our de- our, our as Christians, our identity is Christ. And um, we have to be very intentional about that. Let's just talk about some strategies that will help us to be, uh, you know, social media can can benefit us all, but we have to be better stewards of what we have before us. So what, what could we do as strategies to help improve our usage of social media and along with that help improve our own mental health? I think one thing is to be very intentional about how we use social media, mm-hmm. the time that we use it. What would you suggest? Uh, you know, on your phone, it tells you how much time you spent in social media and how much time you've used the phone, but it breaks it down. And one thing that I've been looking at is trying to lessen that because it if it says I've used it two hours and ten minutes today, that's two hours and ten minutes I don't get back anymore. You know, mm-hmm. that shortens my life by two hours and ten minutes. That what did I, What's my payback? So I'm trying to be more intentional about staying away from it and not paying so much attention to it, not letting it become that drain on my resources Mm -hmm. that it has been before. Mm -hmm. And as you decrease that, then it necessitates, hopefully, face-to-face contact. And maybe the friend that you connected with um, that you hasn't seen in a while, that it encourages you to pick up the phone and say, hey, let's meet for lunch and do a face-to-face where you have the relationship that's real and it's in front of you. And so you're gaining the two hours. Well, how are you going to spend that? Can you spend that in some time that's face-to-face real relationship? My flower beds are getting weeded. <laughs> you know, that's one, one byproduct. Right. You know? And your garden is growing. Yeah. He I never go, had I go that turn the compost <laughs> Oh. Yeah, face-to-face conversations, uh, mm-hmm. eye contact, because we hear, it, uh, we connect soul to soul, mm-hmm. rather than, you know, emoji to emoji. Mm-hmm. There's, a, there's a big difference there. I also think that um, we need to increase our participation in other activities. Mm-hmm. Real life, hobby. real life activity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Slow mm-hmm. our slow our brain down. Right. Um, <laughs> I, I remember a time when uh, many years ago we were in Russia, 
and the kids did not have access to computers, or and that was back in the 90s. They had did not have access to toys. And uh, one thing they had access, they, they were in this orphanage in, um, in, in a rural area. They had access to pine straw. They would take that pine straw and they would create little, the most beautiful uh, little animals like mice and, um, uh, you know, just anything that they could create with their hand. And they would play with those. But when I think of how they're, they, what that did for their brain, they found out more about themselves. They found out they, they, their, uh, their creativity was used in a way that would not have been used even with a toy, even with uh, having access to computer. And so I think sometimes we have to be careful that social media does not rob us of who we are, and especially who we are in Christ. You know, in the 1960s, there was a philosopher by the name of Marshall McLuhan. Mm -hmm. And he came out, there's a quote even today that kind of stands up here. And he said, the medium is the message. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So that he made the prediction that with the changes in radio and television and the different mediums, it'll change the culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and that okay. Is. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're allowing it to do. Mm -hmm. And that's what, what's happening with us is because the senseless time, and I say senseless is a word that you can sit there and you can look at that Facebook, you can look at Twitter, you can look at whatever social media account that is for hours and walk away and have gained nothing. Yeah. You know, and so what have we lost? Yeah. Well, and the climate of the culture is changing and a lot of it is reflected on Facebook, but it also encourages people to be more outspoken, more rude, more, you know, all of that kind of stuff. It, it right. encourages it. And you see it played out on Facebook, but you see it played out nationally mm -hmm. on the right. news. And people can say anything they want to to anybody, you know, and we weren't raised that way. Well, you know? I mean, even, even with presidential elections. Yeah, yeah. You know, it goes back to algorithms. There are individuals who create information bots. Okay, about particular candidates. And they run those bots with lots, I mean, flood the social media with certain types of information to be able to gain popularity for a certain candidate when there's not one there to begin with, not an individual behind that information. So, <clears throat> and from the, you know, from the, I guess, right before the Obama era, we saw a lot of social media work being able to shift the viewpoint of individuals. Mm -hmm. You know, do we want to be controlled or do we want to control our lives? Yeah. And I think that's the I think that's the bottom line. Who's in control? And the only one that can change that is you. It's me. That we can control the information that we place in, in social media, the information that we feed online, we can control that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think first of all is being aware. Mm -hmm how this works, and uh, second of all, being aware of who we are in Christ, and then being careful how we implement our information. We talked today about the impact of social media on our mental health. We began our discussion with the evolution of technology from the 1940s all the way up until today. But we know that this whole world of technology did not just evolve on its own. Very intelligent people have designed and created what we use today that has transformed our lives. But this device that I'm holding in my hand is void of thoughts and feelings and emotions. Because thoughts, feelings, and emotions come from deep within the human soul. And like the world of technology, our world that we live in today did not just evolve on its own from mindless matter, and who we are as human beings, we did not evolve from ape-like ancestors 
we have one creator, a master designer who created us and gave us life. And he loves us with an everlasting love. And that's what gives us value and worth. And that is where we find our identity. John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. This world, this life, and even this world of technology that we enjoy today will one day vanish. But if we have a relationship with our Creator through His Son, Jesus Christ, we will live forever. We thank you for allowing us to share our time with you today. And it is our prayer that you will come to know and embrace the love that God has for you and to enjoy this abundant life that you can have in Christ.